and begin John chapter 8 because we had to stop halfway through the message last week. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, John chapter 7 beginning in verse 45, otherwise it'll be on the screen. It's always good to practice finding things in your Bible though. All right, we're going to start with verse 49, but I want to back it up to 45 just so we get our context happening here. John 7, 45, then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees. These were the temple guards, as we mentioned last week. The officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him, Jesus? They were sent to arrest Jesus. The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? They answered and said to him, Nicodemus, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee, and everyone went to his own house. Let's pray. Father, as we wrap up this chapter and move into the beginning of the next chapter, we ask you to be with us this morning. We thank you for the promise that you would send us the Comforter, the Counselor, our Guide, the Holy Spirit, to teach us and to lead us into all truth. Lord, please cause your Holy Spirit to teach us and feed us today that we might continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. So we pick it up in verse 49. We know the scenario, what's going on here. They'd had that big encounter there. Uh, it's happening during the Feast of uh, Tabernacles in Jerusalem. The people are divided over who Jesus is. And, uh, of course, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rulers don't believe in him at all because they choose not to. It's not to their advantage or their benefit to believe. This crowd does not know the law is accursed. And so they're kind of casting aspersions on the common people. This crowd, or it can be translated this people, or even literally this rabble. And so the common people were treated by the Pharisees with absolute contempt. They were called, the, the Pharisees called the common people the Am Haaretz in the Hebrew, people of the earth, you know, and not in a good sense, you know, earthy, you know, low life. And they weren't even thought worthy to have a resurrection to eternal life. Now, the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not. But even the Pharisees who believed in the resurrection did not think the common people deserved it. And so those who were disciples of the rabbis, they were considered to be in a much better state than your average common nobody. And so their attitude towards the crowd, and again, remember the debate was going on. Some believed Jesus was the Messiah. Some believed he was simply the prophet. Others questioned whether he was either one, but they're looking at these people and they're saying basically this crowd of ignorant nobodies who do not know what we know. Does that sound familiar, by the way? Are we living in a time like that? When there's an elitist group that looks down on you and I and says we don't know anything, we don't know what we're talking about, right? We're stupid, we're irredeemable, deplorable. That's, that was their attitude towards the common people. So Nicodemus steps forward. Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night, being one of them. So Nicodemus was part of their group. He was a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, someone um, whose opinion should have been equal to theirs. Uh, he came to Jesus by night. Remember John chapter 3? You've got to give him credit. He actually made the effort to meet with Jesus and find out for himself if Jesus was authentic. Unlike these other men who never made that effort. And so he steps forward really in defense of Jesus. He says, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? Good question. 
And here these men were who claimed to uphold the law and yet had made no effort to truly know Jesus and they were ready, willing, and able to condemn him for no good reason. Basically condemn him for all the good works he was doing. The healing of the sick, the raising of the dead, the casting out of demons, lifting people out of their lowly, burdened lives, which the Pharisees and the Sadducees were really good at keeping the people oppressed. But they answered Nicodemus and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. So really, again, this is a disparaging statement. They're saying, Nicodemus, are you also an illiterate country bumpkin from Galilee whose belief is worthless and meaningless? Really, Nicodemus, you want to go there? Are you also one of his disciples? It's been said that ridicule is not an argument, and yet it's used quite often, isn't it? There's no demonstration in a jibe, but unhappily, this is the only weapon which the proud and haughty often use in opposing religion. We're experiencing that a lot today in the world we're living in in terms of the current attitude towards Christian believers, not only in this country, but all over the world. I would say that those who are ignorant of the truth or deliberately reject the truth, suppress the truth, they always seek to demean, demoralize, and defame those who are actually in possession of the truth. Do you see that? We certainly see that manifest here with these men and their response to Nicodemus. And they say, search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Again, another thing you'll find, oftentimes these folks think they know everything when in reality they know very little. This wasn't technically true, this statement they just made. Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. So they purport to be experts in the law, experts in the word of God. And yet, what they just said isn't true. Jonah was from Gathaper, in Galilee. The prophet Nahum was also a Galilean, being a member of the tribe of Simeon, and some believe that Malachi was also from that region. Their conclusion was false also just because there had not been a prophet from any particular place, even though there had been. They say, no, no, there's never been a prophet from Galilee. But even if that were true, that's not an argument that there never could be one. Just because the place of his origin had not been specifically stated in Scripture, although it had. They just didn't realize it. They weren't as knowledgeable as they thought they were. Thirdly, they'd never bothered, and this tells you where their hearts are really at, they never bothered to find out that Jesus was actually born in Bethlehem as foretold in the book of Micah. You've heard it many times, Micah 5, 2. You, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, it was just a small town, but it was the city of David. Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. So not only does it prophesy the place of the Messiah's birth, it also shows us that the Messiah is indeed God himself. His goings forth are from old, from everlasting. And so how many people to this very day reject God, the Bible, Jesus, his followers, without ever having sincerely attempted to find out what his claims are and if they're really true? It was certainly true for these men, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, But it's also true for so many people today. They pass judgment on what you and I know to be true without ever really having thoroughly investigated it. Now, at the end of the day, as I tell you a lot, believing is seeing. But that doesn't doesn't set aside the fact that there are many strong proofs concerning the reality of God, the truth of His Word, the person of Jesus Christ historically, his death on the cross, his resurrection, the evidence is abundant, and yet people so often fail to even look at it. 
I think I'm out of water up here, guys. Oh, there's one way in the bottom. Excuse me. Oh. Had to bend over for it. <laughs> you probably heard that little, oh. <laughs> That's what happens when you get older. When you bend over, your body just goes, uh. Verse 53, everyone went to his own house. So that's the end of that conversation. Nothing was really resolved. Having ignored Nicodemus and his pleas for reasonable, rational discourse, the rulers, the Pharisees, still irritated, angry, and determined to eliminate Jesus, they haven't backed down one bit. They're just, they're just going to regroup. They went home, continuing to map out a plan on how to arrest him and kill him. Again, we're right now about six months before the Passover where Christ will be crucified, and uh, their efforts are just kicking into high gear. Um, and I would say that that same spiritual battle that was going on right there with Jesus and the religious rulers, leaders, it's still raging today. I was reminded of this passage in Psalms chapter 2, chapter 2. I'm going to read that whole thing. Psalms 2, 1 through 12. The title of this passage in my Bible is The Messiah's Triumph and Kingdom. It reads like this. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying... Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Now down here we may be deeply concerned about what's happening in our world. And by the way, I suppose you've noticed that Iran has been launching drone attacks against Israel. Um, I found out this morning I'd, I'd known about the initial attacks, and then Iran had said that they were, or Iran had said that they were finished, and then I guess they started up again last night. So, uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, we will be having rapture practice. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but you can practice at home. Usually we say, don't try this at home. Well, I try this at home. Okay? <laughs> Rapture practice. But keep Israel in your prayers. And, you know, there are those, uh, not everybody who identifies as a Christian supports Israel. You might have noticed this. In fact, um, sadly, the majority don't. And one of their arguments is, well, Israel is really a secular nation. You know, and, and to a large extent, that's true. But I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says we're only to support them and pray for them if they behave properly. Just like, would you only pray for your friends and family members who behave properly? If they behaved properly, they wouldn't need your prayers. It's like I was telling the guys back in the back, we were talking about some, some family issues that were going on with one of the guys, and uh, I said, well, if everybody was perfect, Jesus wouldn't have had to come in the first place. And so we don't pray for Israel because they're perfect. We don't pray for Israel because every Israeli is walking with God as they should be. We pray for them because they're the apple of God's eye. They're his chosen people. And he's promised he will never forsake them, just like he will never forsake us. And it has nothing to do with what we deserve, what they deserve. It has to do with finding out what God's all about and getting on board with his plan. And his plan is that he is going to bless and restore the people of Israel. And uh, as we've said so many times in the past, they are really, everything revolves around Israel. If Israel had not been restored as a nation in 1948 for the first time in 2,000 years, we wouldn't even be talking about the end times. We wouldn't be talking about the last days. That's the key indicator 
And everything happening right now is also part of that indicator as all the nations of that region are set against Israel. And by the way, they're set against us too because we support them. As Avi Lipkin has taught us a number of times, we're both the people of the book. We just have another part that they don't <laughs> called the New Testament. But we believe in the same God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, we're told in the New Testament as Christians, we are grafted into the vine of Israel. Let me finish reading this passage. Psalms 2. Let us break their bonds in pieces, cast away their cords from us. And they're looking at us as the ones who are trying to put them in bondage. They don't realize they're already in bondage and the only one who can set them free is Jesus Christ. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath. And that's what's coming. That's what the tribulation is. It's the outpouring of God's wrath on an unbelieving world. And distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is God speaking. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Oh my, that sure sounds like a messianic prophecy, doesn't it? You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession coming soon to a planet near you, King Jesus. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Of course, they won't. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little... Can you imagine what happens when his wrath is kindled a lot? Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So no matter what the world says, no matter what the world throws at us, blessed are those who put their trust in him. No matter what happens, we put our trust in him. Right? All right, we're going to move into chapter 8 now. All the bad guys have gone home to plot their next strategy to try and take Jesus out. And actually, it comes right up here in chapter 8. So verse 1, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in their midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? So Jesus, after this public chaotic encounter with the people, the Pharisees, the rulers, he goes to the Mount of Olives, quite possibly to, to spend the night in prayer, or, but also he was known to Stay there with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in Bethany. That's where he uh, will be when he comes down the Mount of Olives, which we just looked at recently on Palm Sunday. But either to pray or to spend the night with his friends or both. But then the next morning, early in the morning, he came again to the temple and all the people came to see him. Now, after all that big hoopla that went on, in spite of all the conflict, the chaos, the turmoil, Jesus is still drawing large crowds to hear him speak. And he sat down and taught them. And, and I've mentioned this before, but in Bible days, the congregation would stand and the teacher would sit. I kind of like that. We, <laughs> actually, no, I like standing up, so you guys feel free to sit down. Uh, it would be weird if one or two of you stood up, so... I'm fine. But anyway, he sat down and taught them. And we, again, we've talked about this so many times, but throughout the Gospels, we see the great emphasis Jesus placed on teaching 
the people. We're told in the Gospels the reason he performed the miracles he performed was because he had compassion for the people. He was brokenhearted. He was sad about their illnesses, their afflictions, their demonic issues, all the different problems that plagued, and especially the oppression that they were undergoing because of these um, hypocritical Pharisees and Sadducees and the Roman, all the various ways that the people were oppressed. But at the heart of Jesus' ministry was that of teaching. Throughout the Gospels, we see the great emphasis Jesus placed on teaching the people. In the Old Testament, it says the people perish for lack of knowledge or lack of vision. And that vision is not our vision, it's God's vision that he imparts to us. The people perish for lack of knowledge. Without a vision, the people perish. Acts 5.42. So what's happening now? The, the church has begun. Acts chapter 2, the beginning of the New Testament church. Jesus has already ascended into heaven. And in Acts 5.42, daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease doing what? Teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. The miracles were... Helpful, beneficial, but at the very heart of the ministry is preaching and teaching. That was the vision that God gave Pastor Chuck Smith all those many years ago. We talked last week about how some other groups have uh, kind of uh, mocked Calvary Chapel, made fun of Calvary Chapel for putting such a great emphasis on the teaching of the Word of God. But I think God puts the same emphasis on it. So we're trying to do what God does. And as I've been thinking, I, you know, periodically, of course, I think back over the Jesus movement days, the Jesus Revolution movie came out not too long ago, kind of rekindles everybody's interest and thoughts about that era. And uh, there were two key things that came out of that. One was um, a fresh move of the Holy Spirit in terms of worship, uh, contemporary praise and worship, uh, songs and music that... Uh, people of this modern society could identify to uh, going beyond, you know, just the old pipe organ and, uh, you know, redundant kind of worship, spirit-filled worship, fresh worship. That was one of the big things. But even more importantly, there was a real resurgence and revival in the teaching of God's Word. Because at that time, when the Jesus movement erupted in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, the typical church sermon or message usually involved one Bible verse and a bunch of stories, okay? Just to be honest. And then all of a sudden, there's this tremendous hunger and excitement and enthusiasm for the whole, what Paul calls in the book of Acts, the whole counsel of God. That was in my opinion, the most important development that came out of the Jesus movement, the worship, very great, very awesome, but even more importantly, a resurgence and a respect for the Word of God, a desire and a hunger for the Word of God, and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he sat down and taught them, Acts 8, 4, Therefore, those who were scattered, remember, there, you know, there was persecution erupting there in, in Jerusalem against the Christians for a Jew to become a Christian. This is still true today, 2,000 years later. Oftentimes results in being totally cut off from your family and friends. In fact, some groups, I would say probably the Orthodox groups, will actually have a funeral for a family member who becomes a Christian. Did you know that? They consider them as dead so it was a big price to pay. It was a big sacrifice. And so they began to disperse and spread out from Jerusalem. Remember, Paul, before he was Paul, when he was Saul, he was going around on horseback tracking down Christians to arrest them and execute them. So they're dispersed. Therefore, those who were scattered, what did they do? They ran and hid. No. Look what they did. They went everywhere preaching the word. 
2 Timothy 4.2, what does Paul tell Timothy? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season when it's convenient, when it's not, when you feel prepared, when you don't. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering or patience and teaching. I looked this up. It's, it's quite interesting that just in the New Testament alone, the word preach is used 140 times. That's a lot. The word teach is also found, interestingly, 140 times. Altogether, that's 280 times. Preach, teach. You think that's important to God? Absolutely. I was, we were just talking, my wife and I, the other day, the ladies have been studying, um, I think, the Holy Spirit, right? Lynn? Oh, prayer, okay. But anyway, we were talking about how um, ways, you guys studied five ways to hear from God, something like that, right? And we were talking about that, you know, through the scriptures, uh, by the inner uh, voice of the Holy Spirit, by the confirmation of others, and so forth. Uh, and we were talking about that. And I said, yeah, but the, only, the one thing that is completely and totally reliable is this. Okay, I can do my best to tell you what I think the Holy Spirit's saying. Okay, and it might confirm what you believe the Holy Spirit's saying, but we're still, still fallible. We are fallible, right? The one place you can go where you will always get 100% accurate information and guidance is the Word of God, okay? You got these guys that go around and they prophesy over people. And again, I mentioned last week how the damage that's been done to people by some of these teachings. And I've known people who have had these personal prophecies given over them, you know? And they think, you know, God says you're going to be a great evangelist. You're going to go out and, you know, all this stuff. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And then it doesn't happen. And those people become completely discouraged, demoralized, demoralized downcast, and broke. <laughs> and, you know, I know I've, uh, like, couples that have been unable to have children, and I've seen someone prophesy over them and said, God says you're going to have a baby. Now, I've had a sense at times like that that maybe God was saying something along those lines, but I would never tell that person. I would pray for them. Lord, let, please let that be true. Let that come to pass. Their heart's desire is to have a child. But I would never tell it to them because I don't want to set them up in case that's not what God is doing. God says you're going to have a baby. What happens if you don't have a baby? People turn away from God over stuff like that. You've got to be very careful when you start saying that you're speaking for God like Sarah Young, Jesus Calling, Hello. Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season. 140 times preach, 140 times teach. Okay, let's move on. Verse 3. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst... We'll stop right there for a moment. According to extra-biblical records, her name was Stormy Daniels. Okay. <laughs> Not found in the Bible, but other sources purport that that was her name. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but this whole scenario brings several questions to my mind. First of all, who caught her? Was it these men that brought her to Jesus? If so, by what means did they catch her? Or maybe it was her husband. If so, was he the one who turned her into the authorities? We don't know. None of this is really discussed here. But it does, you know, beg the question. 
Number two, where was the other guilty party, the man? They didn't bring him. Number three, were there witnesses? According to Old Testament law, a person could only be condemned if there were two or three witnesses. Deuteronomy 17.6 Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. So they set her in the midst of where Jesus was. They just plopped her right down in front of Jesus as he's there teaching the crowd. That's a bit of a disruption, you might say. Verse 4, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, understand, first of all, when they call him teacher or rabbi, considering their views of Jesus, they probably use this term teacher in a pejorative manner, in other words, expressing contempt or disapproval. When they called him teacher, they weren't honoring him or being respectful. They were really disparaging him. Teacher. And then we have the word adultery here. Noah Webster, our great Christian dictionary writer, 1828, defines adultery as violation of the marriage bed, a crime or a civil injury, interestingly enough, which introduces or may introduce into a family a spurious offspring. <laughs> In a scriptural sense, all manner of lewdness or unchastity as in the seventh commandment. Now, here's something very interesting. And after I read it to you, I'll explain why I bring this up. <clears throat> this is a, a, a paper called U.S. Adultery Laws. Did you know there was such a thing? The United States is one of few industrialized countries to have laws criminal, criminalizing adultery. In the United States, laws vary from state to state until the mid-20th century, 1950 or so. Most U.S. states, especially southern and northeastern states, interestingly enough, have laws against fornication adultery, or cohabitation. Boy, if that was really enforced today, half the people in the country would be in jail. These laws have gradually been abolished or struck down by courts as unconstitutional. State criminal laws against adultery are rarely enforced. Federal appeals courts have ruled inconsistently as to whether these laws are unconstitutional, especially after the 2003 su Supreme Court decision Lawrence versus Texas, and as of 2019, the Supreme Court has not ruled directly on the issue. I'll skip over some of this, but the, law, the last conviction for adultery in Massachusetts was in 1983 and held that the state was constitutional and that no fundamental personal privacy right implicit in the concept of ordered liberty guaranteed by the United States Constitution bars the criminal prosecution of such persons, adulterers. Although adultery laws are mostly found in the conservative states, as I mentioned earlier, especially southern states, you know, where all the uh, deplorable uh, redneck Bible thumpers live, there are some notable exceptions, such as New York. In general, you, three U.S. states criminalize it as a felony, Oklahoma, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Fourteen states, along with Puerto Rico, criminalize it as a misdemeanor. Punishments range from as little as $10 fine in Maryland, despite being technically a criminal offense, not a civil one, to a fine of up to $10,000 and jail time of up to 3.5 years in Wisconsin, and a fine of up to $5,000 and jail time of up to five years in Michigan. There was a couple, March 17, 1983, this article came out. It had to do with a couple that had committed adultery in the 1940s. Uh, Governor Anthony S. Earle will pardon an elderly couple convicted of adultery in the 1940s. 
The governor's assistant legal counsel said Wednesday, this is March 17, 1986 or 83, Juan Colas, the assistant legal counsel, said the couple will be notified immediately. They have not been identified. The couple married and raised a large family after their felony convictions, but said they had never told their children about the incident. Can't say I blame them for that. They added that any friends and relatives who knew of the incident no longer were around. The couple Monday appeared before the governor's pardon advisory board, which unanimously recommended clemency. The woman earlier had written the board saying, I don't like the A I have on my chest, a reference to Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel, The Scarlet Letter. In that book, the Puritan heroine was forced to wear the letter A as a sign of her adultery. The pair had been sentenced to one to three years in prison, but the terms were suspended and they were placed on probation in the 1940s. Isn't that amazing? Why do I bring all this up? Why do I read all this? Because there are many today. First of all, the scriptures make it clear that uh, adultery is a very serious issue to God. The world we're living in today, it's considered no big deal. It's kind of commonplace. And in actually... Even in Jesus' day, it had started to become like that. But there are more and more people today who are arguing that our nation was not built on biblical morals, values, and principles. How often do you hear that? That's a bunch of malarkey. This is not a Christian country. Never were. The founding fathers weren't Christians. This country wasn't based on biblical beliefs. Why do you think a country would have the kind of laws that this country has had over the years, making not only adultery illegal, fornication illegal, homosexuality illegal. At one time, you could be arrested for any of those things. Now, we should all be very thankful that we live under the new covenant, <laughs> under the age of grace, and even in the book of James, it says mercy triumphs over judgment. And we're going to see that next week as we get into the second half of this story. We see that mercy triumphing over judgment as Jesus deals with this woman. But the other side of that coin is we need to see things the way God sees them. We live in a world that's become more and more polluted, more and more degraded, more and more immoral. And although, again, thankfully, we live under this time of grace and mercy, that should not cause us to presume upon the grace of God as so many people today do. And you could argue that all these things have contributed tremendously to the downfall of our society. Why does God take such a strong view on these things, not because he's mean, not because he's hateful, but he made us and he happens to know that which makes us better and that which makes us worse. And we follow his game plan, things go well. When we don't, they don't. So they disparagingly refer to him as teacher. They say, okay, here, we brought this woman caught in adultery in the very act. And so I would again re reiterate the questions raised earlier. One, who caught her? Two, where was the other guilty party? The man. And three, were there or who were the witnesses? And again, as I mentioned a moment ago, according to Bible, some Bible scholars, adultery had become so commonplace in the time of Christ that the adultery laws were no longer being enforced and the waters of jealousy from Numbers chapter 5 were no longer being drunk for fear that the husband's own guilt might be exposed. See, in Numbers chapter 5, it talks about the fact that if a husband suspects his wife of infidelity, he can take her to the priests and then they... Um, take the letters from the law, scrape them off onto this thing of water. The wife drinks it. If she's guilty, she will die. If she's innocent, she will not. That was actually practiced. 
But by the time of Christ, they weren't doing that anymore because both men and women had become morally corrupt. You, oftentimes you might think of Israel at the time of Christ as this great spiritual place. It wasn't. There was a lot of sin in the camp. And that's why Jesus came when he did. Everything about this situation here smacks of setup, doesn't it? Not that this kind of thing ever happens in our world today. Thank God there are no more setups, right? Verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. These guys are the hardcore legalists, baby. No wiggle room here. But what do you say? Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Of course, they considered Moses to be the ultimate authority. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. He was the great deliverer, in a sense, the first Messiah. The, the, the actual Messiah would be part two. Moses was part one. But what they're saying here again, not surprisingly, isn't entirely accurate. It's actually more complicated. Now, Leviticus 20.10, it says, The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Now, in this verse, it doesn't even specify how that death is to occur. It does not mention stoning there. Other places it does. Again, it's clear that adultery under the Old Testament law was punishable by death. Again, that tells you how seriously God takes it. Next week, we'll actually look more at why God takes it that seriously. But there are actually different methods prescribed depending on the exact situation. Albert Barnes, Bible commentator, says the rabbis say that they were strangled. This, they affirm, was the ordinary mode of punishment where and when the method of death was not specified in the law. Like the verse we just read, the rabbi said if it's not specified, then the method would have been strangulation. If the per person guilty of an act of this kind had been betrothed but not married, she was to be stoned, Deuteronomy twenty-two twenty-three. 23. So that would have put Mary, the mother of Jesus, in that position had Joseph not heard from the angel Gabriel and been con convinced by Gabriel that Mary's pregnancy was of God, Joseph technically, although he did not wish to disgrace her, remember he would put her away privately, he could have publicly accused her and caused her to be stoned to death. But if she was the daughter of a priest, she was to be burned alive. Leviticus 16.9, that's the verse where that comes from. It appears, says Barnes, from Ezekiel 16.38 and verse 40, that adulteresses in the time of that prophet were stoned in the time of Ezekiel and pierced with a sword. So different methods, same end result. But if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 22 and you go through verses 22 through 29, it tells us, Verse 23, if a young woman who is a virgin is betrothed to a husband and a man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both to the gate of that city and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife. So you shall put away the evil from among you. But if a man finds a betrothed young woman in the countryside and the man forces her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. See all the different nuances. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. There is in the young woman no sin deserving of death. For just as when a man rises against his neighbor and kills him, even so in this matter. For he found her in the countryside, and the betrothed young woman cried out, but there was no one to save her. If a man finds a young woman who is a virgin who is not betrothed, and he seizes her and lies with her, and they are found out, then the man who lay with her shall give to the young woman's father fifty shekels of silver, Ah, remember Dinah, the daughter of Jacob? And he shall, she shall be his wife. 
could even be a greater punishment. <laughs> she, she, she shall be his wife because he has humbled her. He shall not be permitted to divorce her all his days. And so it's much more nuanced than what the Pharisees were presenting to Jesus. And of course, they say to him, okay, this is what Moses says. You know, again, not adding in all the nuances to the situation. Where's, where are the witnesses? Where's the, they claimed that they were the witnesses. Where's the husband? Where's the other man? So forth. They asked Jesus, what do you say? See, with this question, they're attempting to set Jesus up. They couldn't care less about the woman or her adultery. She was just the pawn in their latest attempt to get Jesus. There's a lot more to this story that we'll look at next week, but I'm reminded there was a guy, a Russian man, named, named Leventry Beria. He was the most ruthless and longest-serving secret police chief in Joseph Stalin's reign of terror in Russia and Eastern Europe. He bragged that he could prove criminal conduct on anyone, even the innocent. What he said was, Show me the man, and I'll show you the crime. And that's exactly how they approached Jesus. He was the man, and they were determined to find the crime, even if none existed. And where do you think that kind of reasoning, illogical, irrational, evil thought process comes from? The accuser of the brethren, the devil. So next week, we have, get to do the fun part where we look at Jesus' total shutdown of these pompous, self-righteous hypocrites. Let's stand. Let's stand. As we go to the Lord in prayer, if you have a prayer request, please raise your hand. Bunches. Okay, Father, Lord, we, we thank you for your word. We know some parts are less comfortable than others. And Lord, this whole story here, which is not just a story, it's a true historical account of an event that took place between Jesus and these evil men. And this poor woman was used as a pawn. But Lord, we ask that you would help us to uh, walk in a balanced way, led and guided and directed by the truth of your word and your Holy Spirit, Lord. We don't want to be legalistic like the Pharisees, but we also don't want to be liberal like so many were then and are today, where we tend to ignore how seriously you take sin. Father, we're thankful that our fin sins have been put under the blood of Christ. Lord, that you are a God of grace and mercy, love, forgiveness, patience, kindness. We thank you and praise you for that, for making yourself known to us in that way so that we don't have to go through life laden down and burdened with guilt and shame that you have washed us and cleansed us and renewed us with the precious blood of Christ. But Lord, help us not to take lightly uh, the sins that are so commonplace in our world today. Lord, help us to love what you love, to hate what you love. We know you love sinners, you hate sin. Lord, and we should also hate sin because it's destructive. It destroys people. It destroys not only our physical lives, it can also destroy our spiritual lives. So we thank you that you've given us the truth of your word, the wisdom and the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Help us to daily walk in those things, to see what Jesus sees, to hear what Jesus hears, to do what Jesus does, to be like our Lord and Savior. And Father, I lift up all those with prayer requests, those for health, with illness, injury, and so forth. I pray that you'd pour out your healing upon them, encourage them, strengthen them, give them relief from pain and suffering, Lord. Just strengthen us in our physical bodies so that we can serve you to the very best of our abilities, serve our families, our friends, our church. We do ask in Jesus' name for physical healing, Father, of various afflictions, illnesses, diseases, and injuries. 
We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. We also pray for healing from mental and emotional issues that, that sometimes plague us, the anxiety, the depression, and so forth, Lord, that can be very, very debilitating. We ask that you would lift our spirits, Lord. We thank you and praise you that you came to heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. We lift up those emotional and mental issues to you and pray that you would bless us with healing in Jesus' name. We also pray for those with relationships that have gone awry, that are broken, damaged, marriages, friendships. Lord, please restore, heal, um, repair those relationships. Lord, we know that uh, the enemy comes to, to divide and to conquer, but we pray that you'd bring us together through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and help us to be instruments of reconciliation, to be peacemakers. Lord, to humble ourselves and to even um, ask for forgiveness when we don't perceive that we've done anything wrong. Jesus did that. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Help us to be like him. And we pray that those relationships could be healed. Pray, Lord, for the economic issues that are plaguing many people today. Help us, give us wisdom and guidance to use our resources wisely. We ask that you would lovingly, graciously provide according to your riches and glory. And Lord, forgive us for those times when we don't use them as well as we should. Help us to honor you with our, uh, with our financial blessings that you put upon us. Help us to help one another. Lord, help us to uh, uh, be thankful for whatever we have, and give you all the glory for it. We thank you that you are our provider. We trust you, we praise you, we thank you, and we ask you to receive now our final offering of praise in Jesus' name. Amen.